Mubarak and welcome to the program. I'm Nima Abuwarte and this week we're in the heart of Dubai's media city, home to the publishers who print many of the region's newspapers and magazines. But times are tough, ad sales are falling and publishers are folding. So is this the best time to launch another title, even if it is the iconic Rolling Stone magazine? Also coming up this week, making money from Mecca, how one company's tapping into the potential of the Hajj pilgrims and making their lives easier too. Landing a profit, but the business of being an airport is hard work when you're only just starting out. And safety above all. Governments may have tightened their belts since the downturn, but it seems here in the Gulf, there's no price too high to keep countries secure. But first, from this month, music lovers can pick up a Middle Eastern version of Rolling Stone magazine. It's the latest title to be published here in the Gulf. Now, it has a strong reputation, but publishing is a difficult business to be in these days. So, will Rolling Stone be in tune with its readers? Katie Watson has been finding out. <laughs> Rolling Stone's been an essential part of a music lover's reading list since the 1960s. It started in the States, but publishers around the world have taken on the title to cater for music fans everywhere. Now, the Middle East has its own version, printed here in Dubai. The magazine will be distributed across the Gulf. The initial print run is 15,000 copies, and publishers hope it'll prove popular enough to boost that number in the coming months. Up to 60% of the content will come from the US magazine. The rest of it will come from journalists in the Middle East. It's a magazine that editor Adam thinks is crucial to this region's industry. If you're a band in Europe, your dream is to break the states. If you're an artist in the Middle East, if you break Lebanon and Cairo and Saudi, you're financially set for life. So why kind of why push yourself into America? For the English language artists, it's really tough. Um, you know, the labels have told us that they're basically not interested in, in signing English language artists from the Middle East because commercially it d just doesn't make any sense. If they've got people like Shakira and, you know, uh, Madonna and Kings of Leon. And, but there are some really talented people who deserve a break and that's where I think this magazine could help them. Other than that... The concept of using an international magazine and licensing the regional rights to it is a growing one in the Middle East. It's also a safer bet for publishers. I think it will definitely bring attention your way positively. Now, had I taken the idea and the concept and the content that was within Rolling Stone and launched XYZ magazine, I don't think that many people would have turned their heads and been so excited about such a brand launching into the market. And that attention is important. The launch of Rolling Stone magazine comes at a difficult time for the publishing industry. In the good times, magazines like these didn't have to worry about money. Advertising revenue practically fueled the growth of the publishing industry. But since the downturn, times have changed, and it's concentrated the minds of both publishers and advertisers alike. Since the start of the global recession in 2009, more than 250 magazines have closed down in the region, with over 150 coming from the United Arab Emirates. That works out at about one in five magazines. In this market, magazines are, are very much dependent upon advertising. Um, a lot of the magazines are either given away free or certainly a, a lot of uh, um, even paid for magazines, a lot of their circulation will be bulk free distribution, which is um, done to increase the circulation to make magazines more attractive to advertisers. And since the downturn, obviously, advertisers have become more discerning in terms of where they're actually spending money, um, and that's made it very hard for the magazine sector. Despite the difficult times, some experts think there's been an upside to the downturn. It started to reshape the industry properly. And so those who remained are actually the big players, those who have the right fundamentals, those who are applying the right way of doing things, those who are treating their 
um, magazines and titles as independent brands and hence a brand needs to be measured, a brand needs to be tracked, a brand has a consumer. If you are getting in an international title, an established title, then yes, obviously it gives it an additional traction. So this new magazine may well get a helping hand because of its reputation, but it's up to the publishers here to win over new audiences and not just those who get it for free. Well, as we just heard from Katie, the music industry is growing here in the Middle East, but not enough is being done to protect artists' rights. And this is a problem right across the region. Here in the UAE, there is a copyright law, but it's not being properly enforced according to industry experts. That applies mainly to music being played on local radio stations, in hotels and shopping malls. And what that means is that artists, a lot of the time, don't get paid royalties for their work. So what's the solution? That's a question I put to Hussein Spek Youssef, head of Fairwood Music Arabia. We need a system of collective rights management in the UAE. So if we use the UK as an example, the society in the UK is called PRS for Music. And so all radio stations, TV broadcasters and so on pay PRS for Music and PRS for Music um, provides them a license and then pays all the rights holders. But is there the system, the infrastructure that'll enable what you're talking about to really happen? There's no issue with the law. The issue that, that needs to change, I think, is that the copyright law also states that the establishment of a collecting society can only be approved by the Ministry of Economy. In other words, if you want to get a trade license to act as a collecting society, the Ministry are the only people that can give it to you. And up till date, the ministry hasn't issued that trade license to anybody. I know of some examples of people who have wanted to set up collecting societies for the wrong reasons. You know, instead of paying rights holders, they see themselves as, you know, million dollar salary CEOs. Certainly the majority of countries around the world, collecting societies are not for profit and they, they distribute out all of the money that they collect other than whatever it takes to keep them you know, to pay salaries, basically. Now, for years, we've heard about the search for talent. Mm -hmm. There have been scouts that have come here to look for Arab talent, but they seem to get disinterested and, and move on. There's a genuine concern as to the development of talent, right? But what we find is we, we look to the rest of the world. How did other emerging markets or new markets deal with that? In Canada, for instance, money collected from revenues due to songwriters there's a portion of that that's reallocated towards investment in new talent. And so when I was a songwriter in Canada, to shoot my first video, I was given a grant of $25,000, you know. And that grant paid for me, but it also paid for a young director who didn't have, who, nobody would hand him a camera to shoot a mu his first music video. Why is this important? It's a chicken and egg scenario, you know. How do you um, say that there's talent or no talent in the UAE, let's say, if you don't invest in that talent. There's a realization that we don't want to stay in just a product economy, you know, or just an oil-based economy. We need to move to a knowledge-based economy. And the only way we can move to a knowledge-based economy is we invest in intellectual property and allowing people to create things. Hussein Spek Youssef speaking to me earlier. Now, how do you grow a business when your business is running an airport? And that airport has been kept hidden from the public for years? Well, that's a question facing Al Batin, the strip just outside Abu Dhabi that's slowly being handed over by the military to a civilian group. Add to that hot competition from Abu Dhabi's international airport just down the road. So, how can that business take off? Philip Pamshir went there to find out with a well marked map. Behind this oak door lies one of Abu Dhabi's aviation secrets the VIP departure lounge at Albertine Airport. Simply walk across the marble-floored foyer, hand over your passport, and once it's stamped, go straight through security out onto the tarmac, where you'll find your plane waiting nearby, like a taxi in front of a hotel. Of course, Albertine isn't for just anyone. It specializes in executive travel for private flyers. Any airport has two main parts, uh, when they say safety and security. That's a given. But when it comes to private jet operators, when you tell them efficiency and confidentiality, 
are, are our st strengths as a private jet airport, that gets to them. This specialization has been important. Just 20 minutes down the road is big competition in the form of Abu Dhabi's main international airport. Originally, Albertine was a military base right in the heart of the city. The soldiers are moving out now and slowly handing over the tarmac. Still, they currently control 50% of the space, which is why Albertine is making a marketing push. For those in the know, it's a useful place to board their private jet. With income so high in the Gulf, services from executive jet companies and private carriers are increasingly in demand. And of course, if you want to shave those few valuable minutes off your time on a long journey, using an airport like Albertine is the way to go. For the wealthy, it's not just about saving time or guaranteed privacy. It's also about the comfort and level of service. In this jet, even the toilet seat is made of leather. And I doubt you'll often see a waiting lounge that looks like the one in Albertine's VIP section. A big part of the business comes not from planes, though, but helicopters. After all, if you've just arrived on a jet, why transfer to a car when you can continue to fly right into the city? For Albertine's customers, like helicopter operator Falcon Aviation, its position is a big plus for their own business. Among other activities, Falcon flies oil workers out to rigs and remote fields. Being 15 minutes closer to your destination means big fuel savings when you're making the trip both ways several times a day. That can be passed on to their own customers. For Falcon, growth has been explosive. Business plan, um, the first one we scratched out, we thought that we'd have uh, between five and seven helicopters by 2010. Today we've got 26. And we thought we'd have two jets and uh, today we have uh, five jets in operation and the sixth one coming in another three weeks. So, yeah, it, uh, the, the business plan's been torn up so many times, it's not funny, and we keep inventing a new one on a, on a monthly basis. So if you run a helicopter company, what do you do when you're not operating an air taxi service? You can take orders to fly football field-sized advertisements around Abu Dhabi for paying customers. Falcon currently has the world record for this kind of thing. Well, that's certainly one way to go about flying the flag for the United Arab Emirates. Philip Hampshire reporting there. Right, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, making pennies from pilgrims. How one man wants to make his business the ultimate destination for people performing Hajj. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuwardi. Now, this week, millions of Muslims from around the world performed Hajj, the annual Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, for most of these people, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And as you can imagine, with so many people doing pretty much the same thing at the same time, it comes with its own set of challenges. And so one man has made it his business to make it as problem-free as possible with the click of a button. We did a research last year and realized that seven and a half million people use search engines to look for a Umrah or a hash package. That's quite substantial for a market, okay, that, uh, and, and the number of people that go to Hajj today and, and how much they spend, nearly out of about two and a half million people every year that go to Hajj, about 600 or 700,000 travel VIP. Why is this a good business to be in? If you have a manual system fraud, with potential human errors, miscommunications, and mismanagement, you're going to have a, a problematic, uh, a problem coming up during Hajj. And so, the concept of automation is always, in general, reduces errors, saves you money, administrative costs, and empowers you to do things in ways you've never been able to do before. So what sorts of problems or issues does your system overcome? Sometimes they're not. Sometimes a person and his brother ends up in two different rooms. So if you go to Hajj and you, as soon as you arrive, you have all these problems that are happening around you because of lack of management, lack of automation, improper listings, uh, things didn't travel smoothly, the data was not input properly, 
checks and balances were not done on it. You've said that you wanted something, somebody else did not register it. Uh, you come to Hajj and you tell them this is what you ordered, you got that, and the person tells you no, you didn't. We try to solve these problems through automation before the person goes to Hajj. So really you're talking about a system or a process that minimizes or removes human error and makes the whole experience more pleasant for pilgrims. If you're going to spend $4,000 to go to Hajj, okay, and you're going to get this much problems, and now the tour operator tells you, would you pay $10 more only to have only this much problems instead? And what would the answer of the pilgrim be? And, and so we, for us, this is important because $10, if you multiply that by 600,000 VIP travelers, that's $6 million business a year just for Hajj. And there's an other equivalent of another $6 million for Umrah. So the, the automation of Hajj and Umrah business for us is a $12 million business a year, which only grows every year by 6.8%, never goes down. So that's, from a business perspective, is a very strong business case for our, for our company. Samir Ramadan from Hajj Mabrur speaking to me earlier. Right, let's see what other business stories are making headlines across the region this week. Staying in Mecca, the holy city's launched its new metro service that will help transport hundreds of thousands of people during the Hajj pilgrimage. It's only operating at 35% capacity at the moment, but once complete, it'll shuttle half a million pilgrims every six hours. The project only started last year and was built with the help of China Railway Construction Corporation. Less than a year after taking care of the shake-up of Dubai World, the Dubai government is helping with the financial restructuring of another of the Emirates' big conglomerates. According to the Financial Times, Dubai Holding has received $2 billion from the government. The company, which is controlled by Dubai's ruler, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, owns industrial parks, financial services and property both in the UAE and abroad. Abu Dhabi has launched the region's biggest industrial zone, part of the Emirates' strategy to diversify its economy away from oil. Khalifa Industrial Zone Abu Dhabi, or Kizad, is located between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. More than $7 billion was invested in the first stage of the development. It'll include a new port and be operational from 2012. It's hoped that by 2030, Kizad will account for about 15% of the Emirates' non-oil income. Governments around the world are cutting budgets and tightening their belts as they try to pull themselves out of the downturn. But one industry seems to be recession-proof security. Top dollar is still being spent on keeping countries safe from attack here in the Middle East, as Stephanie Hancock finds out from Doha. Dignitaries and security experts gathered to rub shoulders here in Doha at a recent exhibition of internal state security. Visitors from around the world have come here to buy, sell, or simply admire a myriad of different security products designed to keep the country and its people safe from attack. While global security spending did slow slightly last year, the first time since World War II this has ever happened. Spending this year is already back up to pre-recession levels. The, the, the Gulf countries are very much looking to buy quality. It's a question of, uh, I am investing in the security of my country and therefore I am not prepared to do it on the cheap. I want the most efficient technology and I'm willing to pay for that technology. In the past, investing in security meant investing in the military. The biggest threat was likely to come from a foreign army. But the changing nature of crime today, with criminals operating across international borders and the growing threat of terrorism, means the way in which governments are choosing to spend money protecting their countries has dramatically changed. The defence threat uh, in some areas of the world has diminished, but the security and ter terrorism threat has increased. Homeland security is becoming a major issue worldwide, and therefore we've seen budgets some security budgets in country actually becoming larger than defence, defense, which is, you know, over the years, defence has always been the key, the key budget. As well as spending more money, governments in the region also have different things to worry about these days. Traditionally, a major part of security spending here focused on protecting oil and gas installations, so crucial to many countries in the Middle East. But as economies here expand and diversify, so does the nature of what needs protecting. 
we're looking at the, the overall critical national infrastructure piece and what you see in that, it's not just about the oil and gas, it's about palaces, it's about, about, about safe cities, it's about the environments that people actually live and work in and making sure that space is actually protected as well. And if you look at the overall um, infrastructure development here in the, uh, in the Middle East, there are new cities, new hospitals, new museums, all being created in this environment and that needs protection as well. Currently, the Middle East spends $17 billion a year on internal state security, and much of that goes on big ticket items such as arms. But security these days is about much more than simple firepower. A big new trend in security today is the field of biometrics. That is, the tracking and identification of people as they move around across the world. With everyone worried about issues like terrorism and immigration, identity is the true key to security. Technology is moving so fast that today, everything from your fingerprints to the shape of your face can be used to help prove you are who you say you are. As countries in the Gulf look to develop and put themselves on the map, more exposure means more potential targets. And it's no surprise that security spending here is forecast to keep on rising governments adopt a mindset of safety above all. Stephanie Hancock reporting from Doha there. Right, that's all the time we have for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme. Before we go, let's see how the region's main markets performed. And remember, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the programme. Email us. The address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, next week, it's one year since Dubai shocked the world markets when one of its biggest companies asked for a six-month standstill on repaying its debts. So how is Dubai doing now? Until then, from me, Nima Abuwarde, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.